Namaste. Well, last couple of days I've been corresponding with this fellow. I guess he's some kind of monk or sannyasi, I'm not sure. But anyway, he's trying to tell me about Tantra. <laughs> and he's quoting some scriptures from, I don't know what lineage exactly, that portray Tantra as a form of yoga discipline involving pranayama, you know, taking deep breaths in a certain sequence and holding the breath and so on and so forth. And it reminded me of something that I had forgotten, even though I used to know about it a long time ago, that there is a branch of so-called Tantra that is of the masculine path. Now, some time ago, we did a video on the masculine and feminine paths, and that we decided a long time ago, actually, to follow the feminine path. Why is this? Because the masculine path is the path of will. Yoga exercise, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dhyana, and so on. This is all an act of will. And we experimented with this and found that it creates its own obstacles. And of course, the obstacle is the ego. The more effort you have to make, the more difficult the exercises and so on that you attempt, the more it strengthens the ego because the ego is about effort. So the ego of the seeker on the masculine path blocks his further progress at a certain point. And he can't go beyond it until he destroys the ego. That's the way they look at it. <laughs> they destroy the ego. And similarly, when they approach Tantra, they try to manipulate the Kundalini. They try to force the Kundalini to arise. And of course, this has all kinds of side effects and unintended consequences. Uh, I mean, how can you force the goddess to do anything? You can't. But she might let you think you are. <laughs> and at the same time, you're simply reinforcing the ego that keeps you trapped in this body. Oh, I can breathe. I can, do, I can hold my breath for 20 minutes, <laughs> whatever. You know, that's not going to get you enlightenment. On the other hand, the feminine path works through surrender. That I don't make a big effort. I let the energy, the natural energy of Kundalini carry me along to enlightenment, to salvation. Huh? because she wants to arise. She wants to join with Shiva. And the, the grantis, the blocks on the path, are the ego attachments. Attachment to the body, attachment to feelings and emotions, and attachment to ideas. So what are these people doing, really, on the masculine path, trying to force Kundalini to arise. Well, really what they're doing is they're taking a heroic posture. That's a nice way of saying they're faking it. <laughs> they're bluffing. <laughs> they read something in a book somewhere that sounded really cool. You know, like doing this heavy-duty pranayama breath control exercise, and this will give them super mystic powers, and, you know, they'll be able to leap tall, sing, tall buildings in a single bound or whatever, you know, and they fall for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Why? It appeals to their ego. 
Oh, I'm going to become the biggest, baddest yogi in the universe. <laughs> so they're off in the corner, huffing and puffing. Why? Why? Because as we have explained numerous times now, <laughs> you are already Brahman. Not you, the ego, but you, the genuine being. Because you are pure awareness. And the objects of your awareness, when there are any at all, are simply transformations or modifications of that same pure awareness. I'm talking about the conditioned stages of consciousness, Jagrat, Svapna, and uh, Sushupti. So because the objects of pure consciousness are only the same consciousness, just transformed a little, there's no duality. There is no duality. There cannot be any duality because you do not experience the world directly. You experience it through the three stages of conditioned consciousness, like a filter. And in the future, once I'm not so lazy and I get around to doing some graphics and animations, I'll show how the original consciousness is covered over by these three layers of conditioned consciousness, like a filter. So the original consciousness is filtered through the conditioned consciousness. Therefore, it appears to us that we are an individual, separate being, independent, living in a material world with surrounded by many, many objects. Uh, and some of them are ours. <laughs> and then we do things to them and so on. <laughs> it's all illusion. And if you would just surrender and give up this fabrication of the ego, which we have gone over in great detail in this video on the teaching of the Buddha very early in the history of this channel, then you would simply see the reality. No big heavy duty sadhana is necessary. Unless, of course, you have built up a huge solid ego and you have to dissolve it to the point where you can see these things. So that's what the sadhana is for. That's what the yoga is for. That's what all the practices are. But let me tell you about my practice, okay? Back in the beginning of this channel, I was doing meditation after the style of the Buddha. And I was concentrating my mind. I was forcing my mind to attend to consciousness. If you watch the Secret of the Golden Flower series, we explain all that. And I was getting light. I was seeing light. Very bright, concentrated light, like a searchlight, you know, like the sun, about the size of the sun very bright and focused light. Well, because my mind was very focused on account of the efforts I was making. Now, I simply put on my noise canceling headphones <laughs> and play the recording of the mantra, the Mahashodashi mantra that I released here. And I relax my mind. I let go of my body. I forget about my name, my form, my identity, my ego, my possessions, and so on. Just forget all about them. And what happens? Instead of seeing a bright, tightly focused light, I'm seeing a whole field of light. Brilliant light but at the same time soft. It doesn't glare. 
Rather, it's suffused and diffuse. Those are beautiful words, huh? Suffused, diffuse. They really carry a sense of what it is, soft, like a kitten's fur. So this is the Divine Mother energy. See, she shows, because she is the world, she shows how the whole world is simply consciousness. And of course, from that, you go directly into the state of no mind. You go directly into samadhi. You don't have to make any effort to concentrate the mind because the mind is enthralled with the beauty of the goddess. So this is love. There's no forcing in it. She wants to reveal herself because that way she gets to unite with Shiva in this very body. So the Kundalini rises without any effort, like it did for me the first time in 1984. I was just sitting. I didn't know any techniques. I didn't have any plan or strategy. I just sat and I watched what happened. And what happened was the whole classical Kundalini rising experience, but without making any effort, without trying to force it, just watching. And she rose all by herself and gave me the most spectacular first path enlightenment experience. That's also described in uh, Secret of the Golden Flower series. So what did I do? I surrendered. No complicated technique, no strenuous exercise, no act of faith. See, what I suspect these people are doing, they're taking the heroic pose. I believe in such and such a path or such and such a method or so and so guru or whatever scripture or something or other. They don't really have an experience of it, but it just sounds so good to them and it's a part they'd like to play in their ego consciousness. So they adopt the pose of someone who has that belief. See, this is the ego of the seeker. Oh, I am making great efforts to transcend <laughs> conditioned consciousness. Ah, you already transcend it. You're already realized. You just have to recognize it. You just have to see it. Like this scripture that this guy sent me, full of all kinds of heavy yoga exercises. And he says, then he says, oh yeah, and by the way, this such and such exercise gives realization of Brahma. But then the scripture doesn't describe realization of Brahman at all. It just goes on to the next exercise. But wait a minute, isn't that the ultimate goal of all this? Wouldn't you devote more time and space to discussing it? But oh, wait a minute, maybe you haven't experienced it. Maybe you're just going on faith. Maybe you're just taking a pose. Maybe you're bluffing and expecting the rest of us to follow along, huh? to follow your example, your heroic quest. No, it's just another form of beautiful suffering. Huh? Noble, egalitarian, self-sacrificing suffering. <laughs> but a long time ago, we took a vow again, back in the beginning of this channel, that we're only going to talk about things that we have personally realized. So if we talk about, for example, Lakshmi Devi creating the universe by sound, it's because we have some experience of that, at least on the human scale. And we can see how it's possible that a vastly empowered being like the Mother Goddess 
could easily create something vast and wonderful using only sound. So since we have some experience of that, we can talk about it without a conflict of conscience. I don't know how some people can talk about different gods and goddesses and different mantras and advanced stages of spiritual whatever if they haven't experienced it for themselves. I think it's a problem of integrity. I think it's a problem of ego and the image that they want to project. I think it's a scam. I think they're bluffing. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti. Aum. Um.